This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Hey everyone, and welcome back. A couple of things before we get started here today. I just want to, this is my last opportunity to remind you about Connected Christmas. This coming Saturday, we want you to get together with someone that you'd normally not spend time with in our church. Go for coffee, go for a walk, have breakfast together, just get to know them. But we want to celebrate Christmas relationally. The church is all about love, and we want you to express love for that person. We want you to listen to them, care for them, even pray with them. But just get together with someone from our church. That is Connected Christmas. And one other thing, I just want you to know that, well, you know, sometimes pastors can be a little self-indulgent. And we get to answer our own questions by research. We have to spend all day researching and even put it into a sermon series like this one. And this one's answering a question of mine. But as I was putting this together, I realized you might have questions that you're not getting answers for. And I want you to know at Nanaimo Alliance Church, we welcome your questions. We want you to ask questions. Ask those questions in your Connect group. Ask me those questions. Ask an elder your questions. We want to know. We do not want you walking away. You know, after without your questions being answered, after 2,000 years of Christianity, it's going to be very hard to ask a question that hasn't been asked before. And there are many answers out there. We want to connect you with your question to those answers. Okay, let's get into today's message. And we are continuing on in the big story. And the big story, answering the question, why does God care so much about sex? In order to answer that question, my question, and apparently yours as well, we have had to touch on a lot of hot button issues. Starting with identity. We talked about identity, and that is such a big deal today. In a biblical worldview, though, we don't come up with our own identity. We don't find out our identity from within us and then declare it. We are given our identity by God, our relationship with Him, our love relationship with Him. And then we talked about the image of God and how when God created all human beings, He made them equal. didn't matter what your race, what your sex is you know, what you, what, even what your religion is, you are equally valuable in the eyes of God because you have been made in His image. And then we talked about the purpose that God has for all humans, which is that beautiful Hebrew word, yada, which means to know, to experience intimately. And that's our destiny. That's where we're all going. And he tells this beautiful story throughout the volume of the, of the Bible and how he, he uses symbols to tell that story. We talked about how God wants to have yada within a covenant, within a, a, a commitment to each other. We talked about the symbol two weeks ago of marriage. We talked about the symbol of sex. And now we're talking about the purpose of sexes, the purpose of sexes today. And this is one more controversial thing that we're going to talk about in this series. And it's 
often the purpose of sexes is largely rejected in our materialist culture, which says that there's nothing spiritual, there's nothing beyond matter. And, and if that, you know, and, and in this make your own spirituality and culture, there is no purpose for sexes. Now, this topic is highly emotional, and I just want to acknowledge that right up front. Because for many of you who are watching this, this is not just theology. This is not just theory. You or someone you know struggles with their sex. They have something called gender dysphoria, which is a tension between what your body says you are and what you feel you are. And those feelings, I just, wanna, I just want you to know, those feelings, I know, they're real. They're real feelings. And we believe you. We believe that you have those feelings. And we just want you to know that we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. There's no place else I'd rather you be than with us. Because God loves you. And you have every bit as much worth and value to God as I do. Or to anyone as anyone else in the church does. And I want to be especially sensitive in this because the among the population, the average for com- attempting suicide is 1.6%. 1.6% of the population will attempt suicide. But among the transgender community, that number leaps up to 41%. 40 one percent and for that reason alone i want to approach this topic with great respect and gentleness and remind you that you are precious to god and you are precious to us now let's move into why the bible says there are sexes and before we do that i we have to define terms because this is really confusing in our culture some people you'll hear the word sex and you'll hear the word gender and for some people they use them interchangeably like they mean the same thing but for others they do not mean the same thing sex is considered to be biological you're born male or female but gender is psychological it is what is culturally constructed it is the the stereotypes that surround a a particular sex Now, I'm going to try to be consistent in how I use these terms. I'm going to try to just use sex to talk about biology and gender to talk about the culturally constructed aspects of that. Um, But I'm not always going to get it right. And please forgive me. I am learning as we go here. Now, the idea of a purpose for sex is, is highly debated. Where sex, your sex today is seen as flexible. Take, for example, my singer Miley Cyrus, who said, I don't relate to being boy or girl. And I don't have to have my partner relate to boy or girl. And for some of you, that might be shocking to hear, but that is very common, especially amongst young people today who see their sex as moldable and even irrelevant. On Facebook today, you have almost unlimited options as to how to declare your identity. And Facebook will even set up you with others who have the same feelings that you do. Now, others disagree. Others will say that there are very rigid ways of seeing sex and gender. And in Brene Brown... Uh, Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection, she is an emotional expert, all things, you know, emotions. She says there are certain qualities that are expected of women, that our culture expects of women. This would be a, a, a gender issue. And she says, if you want to be a real woman, this is what's expected. Three things. That you be thin, that you be nice, and you be modest. So she said, if you want to play it safe as a woman, you need to stay small, you need to be quiet, and you need to be attractive. Hmm. Well, what about males? Well, the most important qualities of men is that you have emotional control. You make work the most important thing in your life. You control the women in your life. And you pursue status as 
the ultimate. So if you want to play it safe, he said, if you want to be a real man in our culture, this is what you do. Stop feeling, start earning, and give up meaningful connection with other human beings. I saw an article a few years ago uh, from BC where a young man was caught doing 70 kilometers over the speed limit. That wasn't the interesting part to me. The interesting part was the sign on his car which said, no airbags, we die like real men. Like real men. Anytime I hear in the media or I read something and I hear this is what a real man is like or this is what a real woman is like, I, 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 my ears perk up to that kind of thing. And here's the message that I think was supposed to be given in that sign, that real men, real men dismiss safety. They're reckless and they're unafraid. Some of you might recall a few years back when Donald Trump was campaigning to be president that a recording came forward of how he deals with women. I won't get into the specifics of that, but the defense of that recording I thought was interesting. Floyd Mayweather, uh, a boxer and then promoter, he, bas he said, people don't like the truth, but John Donald Trump, he was speaking like a real man speaks. Like a real man. This is how real men talk, apparently. Hmm. Now this is important to me because I grew up listening to Christian leaders who would say basically men are like this and women are like this. Here's an example from a Christian leader you would know. I'm not out to shame anyone, that's not the point. But here's what this Christian leader said. He said, men like to hunt and fish and hike in the wilderness while women prefer to stay at home and wait for them. Hmm. He said, men played sports as women watched, yawning from the sidelines. Men derive their self-esteem by being respected. Women feel worthy when they are loved. And you know, I read all kinds of books on marriage written by Christians, and they'd often kind of give the Christian spin to men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And you know, when I'd read these stories about, yes, men are like this and women are like this, often I'd feel like, well, I am clearly the woman in, our, in, in my marriage because they were describing me more on the female side than on the male side. And it doesn't help, it doesn't help that I am a pint-sized, artsy, unmechanical, non-roughhousing, couldn't build a shelf to save my life, guy named of all things, Tracy. Hmm. When it comes to being a macho man, I am not. And there is a problem. You know, on my first pastor gig, I was just in my early 20s and I was even much thinner than I am now. And we had a couple of guys in our church. It was a very huggy church. We had a couple guys in our church who were, they're just giants. They were like six and a half feet, probably had a good 80 pounds on me. And instead of just hugging me, they would pick me up off the ground and spin me around. And, you know, others would say, oh, isn't that affectionate? You know what? That made me feel small. It made me feel insignificant. And guys have this way of sort of creating a pecking order as to who's the biggest. That's, that's part of being a man. And here's, here's the problem. I have read so many accounts of people who grew up in the church who ended up being LGBTQ and they left their faith. And here's one of the reasons, the one of the reasons that they decided that they were, uh, that they were LGBTQ came back to these rigid formulas we had for what a man is like and what a woman's like. And they said, I knew at an early age, I didn't fit in. I wasn't like the other boys. I wasn't like the other girls. And when we have this, these concrete ideas, of what a man is like and what a woman is like, I'll tell you, and especially if the, even if they're taught in Christian circles, it's often based almost solely on culture and not on the Bible. The Bible has a broad, broad range for what a man can look like and what a woman can look like. Well, now, 
to get into this today, let's go back to the beginning. And you'll, re you'll remember in the very first book of the Bible, God creates males and females in his image with absolute equal worth. That is chapter one. But in chapter two, something strange starts to happen. Something really curious takes place. We go from the sameness between males and females to the differences between males and females. And this is what it says. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. Now, there's great controversy today over how literally you need to read this. And for the purposes of this message, it's irrelevant. All you need to believe is this is the story that God wants to tell us today. This is the origin of sexes and what is happening here. You will recall a couple of weeks ago where we found this, this sixth sense moment where this great reveal happens that changes the way you read the entire story. In that case, the, that you saw the entire movie. It was in Ephesians 5, we find out that, that in marriage, males represent Christ, females represent the church. And now, knowing that, knowing that piece of information, go back and read that Genesis account again. Ask yourself this question. Why, uh, are, why was the man created separately from the woman? And why were they created in different ways? What's with this separate creation story where God goes from chapter one where it looks like he made them simultaneously, both equal in, in value before God, to this separate account of them being created? Well, here's the thing. Male and female is a mystery for the materialist, honestly. If, if there's nothing beyond matter, and all that we see around us is accounted for because of evolution, the fact that there are male and female is really a mystery. I mean, what would be the intermediary stages of this to take place? And if our whole purpose as human beings is strictly, as many evolutionary biologists would say, the purpose is to simply pass along our genes, then having male and female just makes it more difficult. But for the follower of Jesus, male and female are all part of design, all part of the telos, and they have meaning. Imagine, God could have made humans in many ways. He didn't have to make male and female. We are so inundated with male and female, it's hard to imagine that God didn't have to make us this way, but he didn't. He could have made us so we reproduce asexually. I mean, you want a kid? Well, twist your ear, rub your left arm below your elbow, hop on your right foot and say, I hate sleeping. And bingo, you're pregnant. You're going to have a kid. He could have made it that easy, but he didn't. The male who represents Christ, it says in that, in that creation account that he was breathed into. And that word breath is the same word that's used of the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God filled this, this Adam, right? That, that, that God breathed into him. Well, remember, Adam is, is a representative of Christ. And Christ was filled with the Spirit. Christ pre-existed the church. The order is important. Christ was there when the church showed up. Jesus came first. And then it says, it is not good for the man to be alone. And I think, oh man, this is where I think we have gone a little bit astray in the church. I, I think the way we have often read this, and the way I often read this was, 
See, Adam, poor guy, he was lonely. That's how we read the story. But that's a bit of a problem if you think about the symbolic nature of all of this. It was saying God was not enough. God was not enough. It's like, it's like uh, you know, Adam was being plugged in. At, even though he, he needed 220 volts, he was only being plugged into a 110 volt source. Insufficient charge. Talk about awkward. Can you imagine the conversation between Adam and God? When, when God's not enough and, and Adam says, um, so uh, dinner tonight, it's uh, is, uh, just you coming? Uh, oh, okay. Pretty awkward, right? And that's the way we read the story. Poor Adam, he was lonely. What's going on here? You know, I, I was following this apologetics website on their Facebook page and someone, you know, lots of snarky stuff comes up. This snarky meme came up and said, if Eve was an afterthought, why was Adam created with, and I edited this, but with the cor correct parts? See, God didn't create a Ken doll. God knew all along that Eve was coming. And he's telling a story here. He's telling a story chapter by chapter. Now here you have Adam, fully capable of love. And he wants to share this. Now, it wasn't Adam that said this is not a good. It, it was not good. It wasn't Adam saying, hey, God, this I, I'm lonely, man. Nowhere in the story does it say that. It's God who declares this is not good. This is not ideal. This is not ultimate. This is not reaching the potential. And he wanted Adam to be able to love others. And so he takes a piece of him. Think of the symbolism here. He takes a piece of Adam, and, and some translate this, this piece as rib or side, doesn't really matter. This piece he places into the female, like a starter kit almost. What is that? This is the image of God. If Christ, if the man represents Christ and the female represents the church, this is, and, and basically all of humanity in that sense, this is God taking a piece of himself, his image, and placing it into these humans. And that's what's taking place here. God is telling the story. And then it says, when, when he, he made the female, he says, he, God, brought her, brought her to the man. This is God's grace, where God arranged this beautiful relationship. He was playing matchmaker. God was literally walking Eve down the aisle towards her husband. You see, God is using this creation story to tell the big story about our origin, the purpose of our existence, our destiny. Have you ever seen that before? How God used these separate creation stories of male and female to tell the big story. And then, of course, that passage in Genesis 2 goes on to the wedding, which we're going to look at another time. But Adam didn't need Eve. It just wasn't good. It wasn't ideal. He had love to share. And so along came Eve, made from a piece of him. Amazing. Now, just a side note here. Some of you might have gotten a little uptight about the word helper and how God made Eve to be a helper to Adam. And you might be saying, you see, that's why I can't believe this Bible, this primitive, sexist, puts down women, misogynistic, backwards, paternalistic book, and you want to go, go hit stop right now. Uh, you know, that, that's what you want to do. Just give me 30 seconds. The Hebrew word helper used here is a really good translation of the, the Hebrew word ezer. It's used about 20 times in the Old Testament, but not of woman's relationship to man. It's used of God's relationship to humans. Here's an example. Psalm 33, 20, it says, We put our hope in the Lord. He is our easer, our help, and our shield. You see, if God, if, if calling females a helper to men is a put-down, then God is putting himself down as well. 
We humans derive so much status based on our work, based on our position. You know, where bosses are seen as more important than employees and get paid accordingly. Where heads of state are more important than citizens. Where the engineer is more important than the riveter. Where in the army, the general is more important than the private. Where Batman is more important than Alfred Pennyworth, his butler. That's the human economy. But God's economy has no such distinctions. Remember, both male and female were made in his image, perfectly equal in value. Chapter 2 creates, for many who read it, palpitations and dry heaving. But turn to Ephesians once again, that great passage about marriage where the big reveal happens, where the husbands are, are said to represent Christ, and the, and the husband, therefore, needs to lay down his life for his wife. Why? In Ephesians 5.26, we read, To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Tell me, who is helping who here? Who is serving who here? And then it says the wife represents the church and is told to submit. Why? Because as the church submits to Christ, as we all submit to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. You see, marriage... As we looked at this before, marriage is a play. And the audience for your play is everyone around you. You are a symbol if you are married. How well do you play your role? You see, ultimately, how you handle sex and marriage personally tells the story about what you truly, truly believe. So when the husband sacrifices for his wife, it's pointing to Jesus who sacrificed himself on the cross. When the wife submits to her husband, she is pointing people to Jesus who submitted to the Father in the garden. Jesus is the example of, for both husbands and wives in marriage, even though wives represent the church. Then it says, at the end of that passage, Paul goes back to what else? The original story. The purpose of the sexes. It says, as the scriptures say, a man, the male, leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife legally, and the two are united into one. The two become one. That's amazing. Now, you might say, that's amazing, but I'm single. Well, hey, I've got a message coming up because you play a unique role in the big story, and I can't wait to get to that. But let's start to wrap things up. We live in a culture that says male and female doesn't matter. It's meaningless. It's arbitrary. In fact, it might even be a mistake. And you know what? If this universe is purely matter, if the Bible is absolutely untrue, that there's nothing beyond this world, then they're probably right. Your sex is random. You just luck of the draw. I mean, X or Y beat all the others to the big egg finish line. Who cares? But... For the follower of Jesus, your sex is not accidental. Rather, it's assigned to you. It's part of your calling, part of your ministry, part of your declaration to the world of the purpose of being human and God's intent for all humanity. Isn't it amazing that on this earth, it's pretty close to half of births are female and half of births are male. Now, if nature was just in charge, whatever nature is, and it, it was only interested in us passing along our genes, we'd probably see far more females being born because you need more females to pass along genes than males. For followers of Jesus who have that worldview, your sex is as much a part of your calling, get this, as when you were born, as where you were born, and to whom you were born. It's part of the story God wants to tell through you. Males represent the person of Christ. Females, the indelible value of the church. Your sex tells a story. A story that predates us all. Your sex is part of the story of where we came from. Who we are, why we're here, and where we are ultimately going. You see, God didn't have to create male and female. He chose to because he wanted to tell a story even in that design, even in that purpose. With every male and female, he's trying to direct our attention 
back to Him, back to our design and what our destiny is ultimately meant to be. Know this, your sex was by design to be worn with honor, to be lived out with purpose, to tell the grandest of all stories, the big story. And we are going to pick it up right from there and move into something that is so beautiful, this concept of oneness, which is crucial to the big story. Don't miss next week's message. It's going to pick up right from this point. Let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, we first of all want to pray for all the people who are watching this, who struggle with gender dysphoria, who struggle with real feelings that can bring a lot of pain. Lord, may they feel your love. May they feel deeply valued by you today. Help us as a church to welcome them, to care for them, to pray with them, to serve them. May the fact that there is male and female remind us of the big story, your desire to marry us. And may it give us hope that we are part of something grander, more beautiful than we realize. The story to which all other stories point. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the beauty of your design. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name.